I get the last half, right? final Sunday of the church year and the first Sunday of the church year. It's like this weird limbo. Are we even in a church time? When do you celebrate? Well, we got a tree behind me, so happy Advent, I guess. So. Everybody stay warm today? Whew! It's a chilly one. First kind of biting one of the winter, I think. But here we are. I turned up the heat, so we should be good here. Coffee, hot water again, some snacks. Have at it. Uh, we are going to dive into a very interesting part of Revelation. Are you tired of me saying that? Fun imagery, as you'll see. That's, that's a joke. It's not too fun. At least it, it won't be for those who experience it. But uh, we're going to continue now, and we're going to dive into, hey, a new lesson. We made it to a new lesson, lesson eight. And we're going to look at chapters 15 and 16, where we get to a new seven. You remember all the sevens that we've covered? We'll, we'll, we'll review a little bit of this later. But what have we, we, so we got the first five chapters. So we kind of, in chapter five, we heard about the first seven, but... Well, technically, the first seven is the first seven letters, I guess, the letters to the seven churches. But from there in the vision, what have we seen in terms of sevens? First, we had seven, seven churches, and then seven lampstands. We had those two. We had seven seals, okay, is when we started the divisions. So each seal is a 
a new part of the vision. And then the seventh seal overlapped with the seven, remember, trumpets. And then we had the seven trumpet overlap into the seven. It wasn't explicitly stated, but we saw that there's seven different visions. And then from there, the seventh vision overlaps now into the seven bowls, the bowls of wrath. So we see all these sevens, they all overlap, and again, we'll take a look at an image later on. Over there. So there's our quick review. We'll, we'll cover some other things later on, but let's, let's dive right in to the introductory paragraphs. Here. The plagues of the seven bowls parallel the seven seals and the seven trumpets. Like the seals and the trumpets, these plagues cover the entire New Testament dispensation until Judgment Day, so same period of time. The plagues of the bulls are, however, an intensification of the judgment represented in the plagues of the trumpets. The plagues of the trumpets represent warning judgments, which still leave time for repentance. The plagues of the bulls are final. They cut off further time for repentance. So we'll see that these are called the the last plagues emphasizing, all right, it's it, this is it, the finality of it. Because the world will be especially wicked and impenitent as the end approach, approaches, the vision of the bulls is especially applicable to the judgment day and the conditions which will immediately precede it. However, the judgment of God, which ends people's time of grace, does not occur only at the last day. Again and again, throughout history, when the wicked despise God's warning judgments and refuse to repent, a judgment of wrath follows, which leaves no more room for repentance. When the wicked despise God's warnings, their hearts are hardened, till finally death sweeps them away to stand before the irrevocable judgments of the holy God. And it says, compare all those passages, we'll take a look at each of those. We're talking about now, this is it, the final, there's no repentance allowed. We'll see how that some of that language is communicated here. But that's it. These are the judgments, and this then can correlate with what he says, the hardening of heart. And we've seen this in Scripture a few times. In Exodus 10, you've got after the tenth plague, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not see my face again, or on the day you see my face, you will die. Moses said, just as you have spoken, I will never see your face again. And sure enough, he was washed in a Red Sea. So this idea of hardening, we find out, I believe, is the fourth plague that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then again he hardened his own heart with another plague, and eventually it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. All right, you're going to reject these warnings Consistently, that's it. I'm hardening your heart. And when God hardens your heart, is it ever going to be unhardened? No. By when we harden our hearts, God still is trying to communicate to us. After that, once the Lord hardens your heart, all right, that's it. His judgment is set. And we've seen other warnings in Scripture on this. Uh, Matthew 12, Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the one to come. And so the sin against the Holy Spirit is a big thing Jesus even here talks about. Uh, this is, first of all, this is not the same as unbelief. If unbelief was the sin against the Holy Spirit, we would all go to hell. Because we all come into this world spiritually dead. What the sin against the Holy Spirit is, is a willful, against better knowledge, rejection of God's Word, and the Gospel especially. You know what the Gospel is, you know what it says to do, and, and yet you still willfully, continually reject it, and reject it, and reject it. And at that point, it's the sin against the Holy Spirit, and, and the means through which the Holy Spirit works, which is the Gospel. Another example of, of this, uh, Jerus, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills, or who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. 
Look, your house is left to you desolate. So Jesus looks down on Jerusalem and laments. Might even be what we're seeing there in that painting in the back. Or he looks down on Jerusalem and ah. Same thing in, in Luke. As he came near, he saw the city and wept over it. He said, if you, yes, you had only known on this day the things that would bring peace to you, but now it is hidden from your eyes. In fact, the days will come upon you and your enemies will build an embankment against you, surround you and hem you in on every side. Sure enough, Jerusalem was besieged, 70 AD and destroyed. Within your walls they will dash you and your children to the ground. And within your walls they will not leave one stone on top of another because you did not recognize the time when God came to help you. They hardened their hearts against the Savior, sure enough, 70 AD. So roughly, what, 40-ish years after Jesus died in Rome. Romans destroyed Jerusalem. They, they, in their mind, they're like, that's it, we're tired of these Jews that keep rebelling against them. And they, there's a history of that there. So they're like, that's it, we're going to wipe them out. Then we have this stark warning in 1 John 5, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not result in death, he will ask and God will, will give life. To those who commit sin that does not result in death. There is a sin that results in death, I'm not saying that he should ask about that. And so kind of this sin resulting in death language, again, some people are like, oh, is he talking about unbelief here? Is this person, some people say, you know, this is a Christian who is clinging to their sin, and therefore that eventually results in their spiritual death and then their eternal death. Pieper, in his dogmatics, talks about how this is really talking about the same thing as the sin against the Holy Spirit, that sin that brings death. So that's why it's listed here from Professor Brew, if you must agree with Pieper. So this is what we're talking about in this section. All these final judgments from God to come. He's, he was trying to communicate, trying to communicate, and still we'll see what is the response from people, even with all of these things. And we'll see it's a, a rejection of him. This is the finality of it. Any questions on this introductory point? On what we're seeing here? Depends on what you mean by back in those days. Well, they destroyed all the Jews because they didn't believe that. So how did, how would the really be different back then? Are they seventy percent? They. It depends on what you mean by the Jews. So are we talking about those who were waiting for the coming Savior, and then they made, they came to faith in Jesus, right? Because technically Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were Jews. Those were believing Jewish Christians. Um, however, there were those who still opposed Jesus and Paul. We hear about him a lot in the New, Te in the New Testament. We also, in, in history then, at that time, we know that there was a kind of a clashing between Jews and Christians. And so those who kept clinging to, basically, I can earn my righteousness before God, I don't need a Savior. Same, similar thing like Jews today. They would, you know, there's different sects in, Ju in Judaism. But by and large, it's either the nation of Israel is really the, the servant that God was um, saying it's the light of the world, not some Savior, or some who are still waiting for a Savior, Him coming. But I would say most Jews today, from my understanding, believe that kind of they are, and the nation of Israel is kind of the Savior. Any questions on that? Good question. All right, let's dive in. Chapter 15. Got a fun image for you there. You know, ch uh, chapter 15, not too long. Would somebody like to read the whole thing? Ryan, go for it. The angels with the seven last plagues. Then I saw another great and remarkable sight in heaven. Seven angels with seven plagues, the last plagues. Because of them, God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw those who had won victory over the beast and his image, and over the numbers of his name, standing on the sea of glass. They held the harps of God, and they were saying the song of Moses, God's servant, and the song of the Lamb. They said, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. 
just and the true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord? And who will not praise your name? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and will bow down before you. Because your righteous verdicts have been revealed. After these things, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of the testimony was opened in heaven. The seven angels who hold the seven flags came out of the sanctuary. They were clothed with clean, bright linen, and they wore gold sashes around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels the seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven flags of the seven angels were completed. Thank you, Ron. So really, chapter 15 is kind of an introduction to what's coming up in chapter 16. That's really all it is. But it's got some important information to help us, kind of help set the tone, especially for chapter 16. Now let's go through the text first for this section here. Uh, look at verse 1. I saw another great and remarkable sign in heaven. So now we have our, our designation, our marker of another set of visions that we've seen when we get into 7. Seven angels with seven plagues, the last plagues, because in them God's wrath is completed. So this is the final destruction of the world is, is kind of being emphasized in this set of visions. Again, same period of time, New Testament era. But now this is emphasizing that finality. Verse 2, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. We've come across the sea of glass before, do you remember? It was Exodus. the... What's that? Exodus is one place. Sea of glass? Yeah, where, the, where Moses took all the all the leaders of Israel up, the, up, the, up, the, up, the, up by the mountain, and there they met with God. And he was sitting on his throne and the sea of glass was like sapphire. So there's a sea of glass there right in front of the throne of God. Throne of God. And we saw that again in also in Yeah, Revelation 4 8. So also in front of the throne was something resembling a glassy sea, which is like crystal. Now this one was like crystal. What do you notice this one is? Mixed with fire. Mixed with fire. How could you have water mixed with fire? So it's probably being reflected. There's a God's wrath idea. There's this judgment fire connecting with God's wrath. Uh, some say, you know, maybe he's seen the seven golden lampstands being reflected in the glassy sea. But with what we're about to see, I think God's wrath fits better with that picture. That fire is mixed in. And so he gets this, he sees this glassy sea, and it's kind of a reflection of the fire that comes around God's throne in his judgment. Not what he's saying. Notice who was there. I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast and his image and over the number of his name, standing on the glass, the sea of glass. Who do we know can walk on water? Jesus. He helped Peter do so when Peter had full faith and trust in him. Once that start, doubt started to kick in, he starts to slow, uh, sink down. But there they were. Uh, it says those who had won the victory, literally in the Greek, it's victors. The victors from the beast. Why was that important, do you think, for John's readers? Comfort. Why? Why, why comfort for them? So not by them, but by Christ. And we'll talk about that in a second. But think about what they are, for John's readers, what they're facing. Remember, what we go back to the letters now. This is all the way back in chapters 2 and 3. What were these churches facing? Persecution. Persecution, left and right. And even some of them had been martyred. And now we hear that they are what, though? In heaven. They're the victors. They're the, in heaven. They're the winners of this whole thing. What's kind of neat is uh, the same word, but emphasized is in Romans 8. You've heard this before. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
Just as, as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Here, literally in the Greek, it's, it's hyper-victors. So victors, but hyper-victors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And don't we see that here in Revelation 15? There they are, glassy sea, that peaceful, not a ripple, no wind affected it. They're the hyper victors. Notice also that it says they they won that they had won the victory over the beast. Again, it's just victors from the beast. Usually you would use victors over somebody, right? If you were the one that won the victory. But why is victors from the beast very fitting dramatically here? The beast hasn't been able to conquer them. The beast was trying to conquer them. <clears throat> did they fight and win? Who did? Christ did. Christ did. And so remember what the beast was trying to get them to do. The beast was, was trying to get them to bow down and worship him and, his, and the image of him. And they resisted that. So in a way, it was kind of victory from the beast in his attempts. And it was ultimately Jesus that won that victory. So just a slight little, you know, one little word, dramatically. But it, it says a lot. It speaks a lot. Who gets the credit? And what these people did. They didn't bow down. Now, how is that reflected in their song? Good verses three and four. How is that fact that Jesus won the victory? How do you see that reflected in those verses three and four? Who? God. If, if they were the victors, why are they praising God? Again, another indication of how they received their victory. So, you and I. What does that mean for us? When we try to battle a devil, do we win? No, but we know the strength of us. Absolutely, and yet you and I, even though we know that, we can still think we can take him on. So when he comes and attacks us, what do we do? Do we put our trust in ourselves? No, we, we go to the Word, we go to the one who, who won that victory for us. So just an important thing for you and me to bring into our lives now. If I want to beat this sin, if I want to beat the devil and his temptation, if I want to beat this persecution that I'm facing, we're going to trust in ourselves, we're not going to win. We have our victory, as it says here, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of Nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, praise your name, and so on. You alone are holy. Why also is that a fitting praise for what's about to come? What are these seven bowls again? His wrath. Why do you think they would emphasize God alone is holy? As he's about to pour out wrath. And he's, like you said, he's justified in that. He's just. He has, this is who he is. He's holy. And therefore, comes his wrath upon sin. So as we're about to face this, it's going to go, ooh. And we can, might wrestle with, how could a God of love do this? But remember, he's a God of justice, too. And so this is why this whole introductory chapter here, before we even get to the bulls, emphasizes that. Like, this is, this is not anything that God's just flippantly doing. This is well-deserved. Go to verse 5. After these things I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of the testimony was opened in heaven. What's the tent of the testimony? The temple, wasn't it? Yeah, well, close. 
the tabernacle. Yep. So once again, here's what the tabernacle was. Uh, again, we have more imagery of the temple or tabernacle in terms of God's throne in heaven. So we know exactly what he's trying to communicate there in the Old Testament. But once again, remember, we've got the Holy of Holies in here. That's where God's throne was. It was on top of the atonement cover of the ark. And we've got the holy place where only the priests could go. Hold on to that thought. And the courtyard, again, where was all of this? It was situated right in the middle of everybody. So this, it was open. Why is that a big deal? So we could go to God. It was always had a curtain in front of it before. If you're an Israelite and the curtain was opened up, would you be happy back in the Old Testament? You'd die. You'd die. If you'd look in there, you'd see it, you'd die. Right? You were sinful, God is holy, that was the, what was being communicated. So this is a big statement for a Jewish Christian that, ooh, I looked and it was open in heaven. Okay? And then who comes up? Verse 6, we get seven angels who hold the seven plagues come out of the sanctuary. So I thought he already saw the angels, but that's why verse 1 is kind of a summary statement of what's to come. Now he's actually seeing it in place. So seven angels holding the seven plagues coming out of the sanctuary. Beautiful, we see their purity. Um, emphasize their clean linen. Flip it over, go to verse 7. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels and the seven gold bowls full of God's the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Uh, bowls given to the angels by whom? One of the four living creatures. What were they again? Creation. Yep. So what's the significance, do you think? This wrath of God is going to be thrown upon the entire earth. The entire earth. So all of creation again. So it, it's not a coincidence that he's receiving the bowls of wrath from the four living creatures. One of them. And then verse 8, we hear that the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God. And from his power, that was that's very much taken from Isaiah in Isaiah's the account of his calling. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of the one who called, and the temple was filled with smoke. So here, more Old Testament imagery as we see this. And now that last statement there, no one able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Why? Why was nobody allowed into the sanctuary? What's this communicating to us? Joey? Okay. That's it, right? There's the judgment. And, and I think you're right, that, that finality. Let's go back to the, the tabernacle. Tabernacle, temple, same thing. Who are the only ones allowed in here? So when we're talking about going into the sanctuary, what is that referring to? Well, there too, but also also in here. No more separation. Not yet. This was God's representative, so only the priest could enter into here. Only the priest. So who was not able, no one was allowed to go into the sanctuary. That's the same. No priest was allowed to go in there. Why would a priest go into the tabernacle or the temple sanctuary? What were they doing? Offering sacrifices. Offering yeah. sacrifices on, the ha on behalf of people. They were representing the people beforehand, before God. So they would be out here, they take the sacrifices, and then they go into the sanctuary on behalf of the person. And so no more representation is being allowed here. 
This is final judgment. That's it. There's no more prayers of intercession. There's no more de declaring the gospel to these people. This is the final judgment. That's it. And we see that in kind of idea in Jeremiah a few times. Here's one example. God, when he's, that's it. Jeremiah, he says, as for you, Jeremiah, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or a request for them and do not plead with me. I will not listen to you. So just an example of God's judgment coming up against the nation of Judah there right before he's going to destroy him with Babylon. Don't even pray for them. I've made up my mind. It's not going to change anything. So kind of a similar idea here now where we've got no intercession being allowed. No one will enter the sanctuary. Ron? Well, only the high priest was able to go in there one day of the year, right? The, day of the, the holy of holies. Yeah. Yep. The sanctuary, the whole thing, the holy place also included. The other priest could enter that one. Yep. But you're right. Only into the holy of holies could be the high priest himself. But any questions on what's being communicated there? Basically, chapter 15 is, is what? Introduction for the seven bulls. And it's communicating what? There you go. That's the final. That's it. It's final. Here we go. And if you're questioning God and his final judgment and what he's going to about to bring on his people, remember he's holy. <laughs> and those, it's not like it's going to be on everybody. There's going to be victors who don't worship the beast or his image. And they're going to be spared from it. So you see the difference there. Uh, so another stark contrast between believers and unbelievers. So there's chapter 15. Uh, let's go to uh, the paragraph there in the commentary now. The judgments are introduced with a picture of the joy of God's saints. They sing a song of rejoicing that they have been delivered and that their enemies have been judged. Just as Moses and the Israelites did when they had safely crossed the Red Sea. See Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 if you want to mark that down too. Similar thing, but especially Exodus 15 is reflected here. Because God is just and true, he brings judgment on those who have despised him. All the judgments he sends are deserved by those who receive them. Uh, that's one thing that we didn't mention. Also, if you go to uh, back to chapter 15, verse 3, very specifically says, and they were singing the song of Moses. That's a shout out now to Exodus 15. What was that right after? After they crossed the Red Sea. After they crossed the Red Sea. They crossed over. God's people, or uh, the, the waters washed away the Egyptian people. And then you have what's called the Song of Moses and Miriam. And it's the song celebrating God's victory over that. We see this exact thing here. Again, Old Testament imagery being used in Revelation. It says in the Song of the Lamb. But the Song of the Lamb was great, marvelous, are your works, Lord God Almighty. That's the Lamb. Right. Divinity, right? The divinity of Christ? Yeah. Emphasize there. Yeah, scripture doesn't doesn't shy away from that. Can you consider chapter 15 a transition from the comfort portion of Revelation to the verses to warning and to be a transition into the comfort that God's wrath will destroy all those who reject him? From our perspective, right? Our comfort. Uh, I would say still an unbeliever or somebody you know reads this and, and you and I read this too and there's still that warning for us if you read it but when you're in the book of Revelation yeah now it's God's people celebrating here comes the final judgment we've been promised upon sin that they deserve is that what you're saying yeah when Jesus Jesus was born there was fulfillment of the messianic prophecy and now God's wrath has been paid here it is. God be praised at the fact that our just, holy God is going to punish sin as a just, holy God should. And then praise him because his works are so amazing because he saved us from that. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I would say it's not a comfort for those who are going to experience it, though. And so let's dive into that then. Next, uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. All right, now get ready. This might be one of the worst pictures I've shared yet. Okay, uh, you're welcome. Question mark. 
we'll see this picture a number of times as we go through the bowls. So you notice uh, in the Bible it says the first five bowls, but there, there's a reason why the uh, Bible study author does just the first four bowls. But we'll take the first four first. We'll, cut, we'll, we'll go with his. Uh, verses 1 through 9. Would somebody like to read these? Mark, go for it. I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and a horrible and painful source came on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood, like that of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned to blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, You are righteous, the one who is and who was the Holy One, because you have made these judgments. Because they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, you have given them to blood, you have given them blood to drink, and they deserve it. And I heard the incense or altar saying, Yes, Lord of God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to burn people with fire. People were scorched by the fierce heat, then they blasphemed the name of God, who had authority over the plagues, but they did not repent and give him praise. Sounds pleasant, huh? Let's go right to the commentary right away on this one. The first four bulls parallel the four trumpets of 8, 6, and 12. Both sets of judgments smite the land, sea, inland waters, and heavens. The judgments introduced by the four trumpets were partial warning plagues. The four plagues in this chapter are final and total. These plagues are the final outpouring of God's wrath. Like the final plagues in Egypt, they affect only the ungodly, and they lead to blasphemy rather than repentance. And we'll take a look at that later on, too. But just to kind of show you, found this kind of summarizing. Remember, the seventh of each of these sevens goes and leads into the next seven. And then especially when we take a look, this is, I just took some scans of a commentary, uh, really, I thought, this is really good when we're comparing what we covered in the trumpets. We see a lot of correlation between here. So obviously this is the same era. This is the same sort of a thing being communicated just as it's been saying. It's intensified though. It's final. So for example, the vision of the seven trumpets. The first trumpet was a plague of hail. Fire mixed with blood falls on the earth. A third of the earth is burnt. Just a third. Now we have the first bowl poured out on the earth. A bad and evil ulcer afflicts the men who have the mark of the beast. So once again on the earth. The second trumpet, a mountain of fire cast in the sea. A third of the sea becomes blood and a third of the creatures in the sea die. Just a third. However, in the second bowl poured out on the sea, the sea turns into blood. Every living creature in the sea dies. Everyone Third trumpet, a great star falls on the rivers and fountains of water. A third of the waters become bitter and many men die. The third bull, however, poured out on the rivers and fountains of water. They, they turn into blood. And we'll talk about that. Fourth trumpet, a third of the sun, moon, and stars is dark. And fourth bull poured out on the sun and are burned by the resulting heat. So this is the first four bulls especially we see it. But it continues on. Once we see the fifth bull trumpet, it's a star falling from the heavens. And then eventually we have the throne of the beast. Okay, we have the darkening of the sun over here. We have his kingdom being darkened. Sixth trumpet, great army comes from the region of the Euphrates. Six bulls poured out on the Euphrates. We'll cover that later. Seventh trumpet, the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of Christ. Seventh bull poured out on the air. Earth passes away, crashes into the lightning and thunder. And there we have God's final judgment. There comes his heavenly kingdom. So it's, it's kind of a, a repeat, but intensify. This is also a common uh, occurrence in scripture where if you have multiple visions of something God's kind of trying to communicate something to you. Can you think of any examples where people receive multiple visions of the same thing? Yeah. Okay, multiple times. Similar thing, similar message. Good, give me another one. 
Okay, now you mentioned two different things there, and you're both right. Joseph had dreams of what? His family bowing down to him. He had it twice. Stars, and then was it sheep or something? Yeah. And then Pharaoh had dreams. What was it? The seven oh. cows. Cows and and the wheat again. So similar thing there. Who else did? Daniel did as well. But he, for example, when Joseph is communicating to Pharaoh, <coughs> hey, you had two visions. These are what they mean. By the way, the double dream was shown to Pharaoh because this matter is established by God and God will bring it to pass very soon. So two things being communicated really when God is repeating visions. It's yes, it's going to happen and it's coming soon. Once again, fits right in line with what Jesus says about the last day in Matthew 24. As we look at these five bowls, what kind of what has to come to mind for you? Water being turned to blood. We've got the sun. We got the the plagues. Yeah. Again, we've got plague imagery being injected into these wrath into this wrath uh, in Revelation. So it's borrowing the Old Testament once again. For communication. Look at verses 2 through 8 then as we look at these. So the first bowl went where? Earth. The second bowl? Sea. Third bowl? Rivers. The fourth bowl? Oh boy, how many? Four. So number four again? Again, this is the whole earth kind of being communicated once again here, the whole earth. Now we've got, keep in mind though that this is not necessarily, this isn't physical judgments now. Remember back with the trumpets, we were talking about what kind of judgments? Spiritual judgments. Where now we're talking about, remember when we got into the demons and they were attacking things, that was the trumpets. And so we're having a similar thing communicated here. These are spiritual judgments. This isn't necessarily, this isn't, on creation itself that's affecting everyone in creation, but these are actually spiritual judgments and, and we'll see what that has to bring. Yes, Mark? I was just going to say um, verse 6, because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets who have given them blood to Hold on, hold on to that thought. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Did <laughs> I hear an um? No? Okay. <laughs> Alright, so the question is, is this just being wrath communicated in certain ways with Old Testament imagery for, again, representing the earth? Or is there something specifically being communicated with each of these afflictions? I, I, first of all, I want, to, I want to caution us to try to figure out every little detail in Revelation. Okay? But I'll, I'll communicate with you what some commentators have said about what each of these afflictions mean. Again, remember we're talking spiritual judgments. So you got the first one. What happened? Horrible and painful sores came on people. Uh, and keep in mind who? Who had the mark of the beast and worshipped in his image. Again, spiritual judgment here. So some, sometimes the boils, somebody has mentioned, you know, is this talking about the conscience? You know how when you commit a sin and you know you don't have the right religion for it, it just creates more of a burden and a pain and how a burden of conscience is one of the most painful things you can have. And, uh, that's been communicated by some commentators. Verse 3, we see the sea becoming blood like that of a dead man. So it really is meant to be a very repulsive image here. And then what happened? Every living creature died. So what is this communicating? You know, is this is this communicating, you know, when people worship nature? By the way, what's nature worship called these days? Spirituality. Pantheism is another word for it. However, what's the closest thing to pantheism these days? By the way, pantheism means you everything is God, right? We all return to God. If you've seen Avatar. That's very similar. Everything is connected to God. 
Um, but pantheism, very much connected with the worship of nature, which these days is, it just goes, really goes by your name. Yeah. Evolution, yeah. <laughs> it's all naturalists. Uh, they worship nature, really. If you ever read atheists and their literature, you see that they talk about nature, and they acknowledge this. They talk about nature very much the same way that Christians talk about God. So that's really nature worship these days. So is this what is kind of being condemned, like worshiping creation? Think about how many times God has said in, old, in the Old Testament that you bow down to images of this animal or this animal or this animal, and it was a condemnation upon them spiritual judgment. So, is that what's being communicated here? That's been brought forward. And now, Mark, the third one. <laughs> what happens? Now the inland waters all get turned. So these are basically where everybody's living now. Again, communicating with the, the Nile and all the buckets of blood and everything in Egypt. But, what is the judgment? Drinking blood. Would you want to drink blood? Unless you're a vampire. And it, it, when we started this whole thing, they said that all of the saints underneath the throne who had been beheaded, you know, they, they had been beheaded or mar martyred or beheaded. But at the same time, that's what Muslims have done for 1,400 years. Yeah. Keep holding on to that thought. Yeah. But go back to the drinking blood. Kind of said that's a that's a, a just punishment. That's kind of what they're saying there. But why is drinking blood so repulsive? I mean, you and I understand that. It. Yeah, it's disgusting. However, this is also to a Jew. This is an Old Testament believer. This is very fitting. Leviticus 17. If anyone from the house of Israel, from the aliens who reside among them, eats any blood, so they're talking about keeping the blood in the animal, not pouring it out. I will set my face against this person who eats the blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I myself have given it to you to make atonement for your lives upon the altar, because it is the blood that makes atonement by means of the life. Therefore I have said to the Israelites, none of you shall eat blood, nor shall any alien who resides among you eat blood. So this is a big deal. You're supposed to be cut off. If you keep reading this, it says, you, they shall be cut off if they drink any blood. And so to an Israelite, this would have been repulsive, the fact that they're drinking blood. This is the ultimate sign that they are cut off from God. Final, it's done. This is a big deal, by the way, in the New Testament church, because pagans, when they became Christian, what do we do now? Can we drink blood or not? What does the law say? Are we free from this? Go read Acts 15 if you'd like to read more on that. So there's the drinking blood idea. It's, it's uh, another spiritual judgment. The fourth one, what happens? Got to go down to verse 8. Sun. Now the sun starts doing what? Scorching, Scorching them and burning them. Um, as someone who sunburns easily, this one really hits home. What do you think this symbolizes? Uh, power. Okay, God's power, even though, you know, having the sun do that. God's turning that false worship back on them. I think that's part of it, too. We see God's power in that, too. What did the Egyptians worship? The sun. The sun, Ra, right? You had, now the sun is kind of turning on them, in a sense. <laughs> and so... Some people and commentators say that this is false doctrines afflicting. All right, you want to follow your false doctrine? God says, go ahead. Let's see what happens to you. And that's when you get the burden of conscience. That's when you get the hopelessness. You get the um, all the darkness that can come with unbelief. Sure. You get this, this theme of, you know, like this judgment on people that, you know, they think they believe themselves above everything. They believe in them. So then... We have the boils, right? So, like, basically, just changing and destroying their image, and then changing the water to blood. You know, like it, it's such a life-giving thing. You know, like you get thirsty, you drink water. You depend on it for animals and fishing, and it just just like that, it just changed and you know, the burning too. So, um, it, like like we've been saying, you know, it's it's a 
God's judgment on this the okay, don't believe in me and your religion and yourself is what it will do to you know you not believe in him. It turns on you, it changes everything, it, it affects you negatively. Again, you hit me personally there when you talked about no fishing. That would be really good. <laughs> Maybe the third one. The third one more hits me than the fourth. No, no, no. But you, that's very much the idea, right? And, and even one commentator said the, the rivers being turned to blood brings to mind like the water of life, Jesus being the water of life, the living water. And now that's totally that's changed. What are you going to get from drinking blood? It's not as refreshing as water. So, yeah, very much part of that, too. Not that I know. Not that I know. But you see kind of what's being talked about here as what Paul has said in a couple of places. One of them being 2 Timothy. It says, For there will come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in line with their own desires, they will also turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now they do that. What does God do? Second Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan. With every kind of miracle, that is, with false signs and wonders, and with every kind of unrighteousness that deceives those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And because of this, God continues to send them a strong delusion. So that they believe the lie in order that all those may be condemned who refuse to believe the truth but instead delight in unrighteousness all right you're going to follow this lie you're going to reject the truth god as a judgment upon them guides them further in a sense into their unbelief like all right this is here you go made your bed now you're gonna lie in it this is what really it brings that's, in a sense, a summary of the last day as well. Let's go to verses 5 to 7 then. Just taking a look at those as you see that response now. I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, the one who is, who was, the Holy One, because you have made these judgments, because they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. I heard the incense altar saying, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So, first of all, my question is, why this interlude? You notice that the, the bowls were flowing there, first, second, third, then you have this interlude before the fourth. They're drinking the blood. Why are these voices saying these things at this time? Make people think. Okay. About what? You had mentioned it earlier. Think about think about your sin and the fact that, that how basically they want people to think about how undeserving they are and how awesome God is with the fact that he saved us. Well, what have these still, people have done? But they still aren't going to repent. But what they did they killed, do? They killed his prophets. There it is. So the voice says they brought it on themselves. Yeah. Really, they deserve it. So this answer is really, boy, this is these are some terrible, this is a terrible bowl of wrath, God. How, how can you do this? And uh, an angel points out, hey, this is fitting. Drinking blood. They shed the blood of God's people. It's very fitting. So it just kind of answers that. How also, how would this mean, what would this be for God's people to hear this? Again, keeping his promises, what a comfort, in a sense. It's tough for us to, to rejoice over God's wrath upon unbelief because we want people to be in heaven with us. But when that final judgment is there, you and I are going to say, praise the Lord for avenging those who persecuted and killed his people. This will be a comfort to John, uh, John and also the, the churches there again. So the first time was when Cain killed Abel, and God says, what have you done to your brother? You poured out his blood on the ground. His blood cries out to me. His blood cries out to the ground. He poured it out. He poured out the blood of one of the prophets. Abel was called the prophet. Yeah, good connection there, too. 
So we see this this enter, also verse 7 then, uh, the incense altar. How can an altar talk? <laughs> True. <laughs> Heather's like, that's actually the most believable thing I've ever heard. Of. <laughs> the incense altar was where the smoke was from the incense, became, and it was the prayer of the saints. Yeah. So, quite possibly, what's being communicated here? Who's agreeing? The saints. The saints. What would, what did we see in chapter three? Yeah. The fifth vision was that cha yeah. end of chapter four. When we do the fifth when seal. When? When are you going to avenge us? And so, in a sense, this altar of incense, no, all those cries, of, yes! Absolutely, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So we kind of see that echo there. Some people will say, this is also referring, we remember, uh, I don't know if it was last chapter or two chapters ago, we read about this angel coming out from the incense altar, and then saying something, some people say it's just referencing that. I think, I think we see a connection there with the seal, the fifth seal, way back, way back when, chapter four or five. So again, more, more imagery being doubled. Verse nine then, well verse eight is the, is the, the sun, but then verse nine, people were scorched by the, the fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, but they did not repent and give him praise. So why is that a key verse? My question to you, why is that a key verse? It shows how hard their hearts are that even they're seeing all these parts of God's power it still doesn't draw them to repentance. Yeah, and, and the repentance is the key, isn't it? Again, we're talking spiritual judgments here. And now this is the finality of it. They they're not getting the message. This is the end. Nothing's being communicated. So they still didn't repent, like you said. What does this verse teach us then? Number your days. <coughs> okay, number your days. Yep. What else? You know, they should try even harder to spread the gospel if they didn't want. We don't want people to do this. So we have to even say, yeah, we want people that be nice people, they're full of Jesus, but how about the ones that we feel are so full of but not quite there yet? Like, the second one they had been the best and best. I think even for those that may be full. Yeah, well said. You got you know somebody that you love? You don't want them to face this. This is the final judgment. When when is the last day, by the way? Could be in five minutes, right? Um, how fitting would that be, by the way? For us to be going through this. Maybe God will wait till Revelation twenty two. We'll be at the end of the church here. <laughs> yeah, there you go, we're in the limbo. This will be the time. We figured it out, Mark. <laughs> yeah, so tell them. Uh, you don't know. You don't know when. Communicate it. What else does this verse teach us? <laughs> and not that it's like comfort, but you know, we spread the gospel to tons of people, to tons of people, and there's still people that are like resistant to us saying that to them. But it's just like, even there will be people, even if they're seeing all these signs from God, will still be resistant. So I mean, just that we shouldn't take it personally when someone rejects our message. Who gets rejected himself? God. God. By the way, what they do with Jesus? <laughs> they crucify him, right? So good reminders for us as we share it, and if they get, if we get rejected, that really kind of puts us more in, in good company, doesn't it? And who are they really rejecting? God. Yeah. Mark? I was just going to say the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they sat there every day for three years, they watched Jesus work miracles. Because there was always at least three or four of them around all the time. And they watched him every day heal people, uh, uh, raise the dead, feed people. They, they saw that every day and they refused to believe their eyes. <coughs> they should have known that the signs from God. I know. I'm so glad we're better than them. <laughs> so I took that. I took that. And I twisted it. On you. You I twisted it on you. But you're right. Like they were there all the time, and they saw him. And you and I look at our lives then. Yeah. 
we better not make the same mistake. Yeah. Here we have this this house of God. Um, you know, I sometimes wonder that too. Living next to a church is, is kind of interesting. I always wonder about those people that live like on the same block of a church. You know? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's two churches on this block. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> But someday they're standing before God. God says, you didn't listen to me. Well, God, I mean, what excuse could they have? God's going to say, you literally heard the bell. You complained about it. <laughs> you heard the bell every day, every Sunday. Uh, just, just an interesting thing. He's right there. We have to think, too. He's right there for us. Let's not make that same mistake. Let's go into now the fifth bowl. It's a shorter one. <coughs> So let's get into that one there. It's just verses 10 and 11. Would somebody like to read those verses? Sorry, I'll get you back to your favorite picture. Helen, go for it. The first angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. The beast kingdom was darkened. People gnawed their tongues and their torment. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their torment and their sword, but they did not repent of their deeds. Okay, so now we see a kind of a change in emphasis, don't we? Now we go away from this picture of being subjecting creation. Again, all of creation being emphasized. Now we see it affecting what? Satan. This isn't Satan. This is technically Evil. the beast. Remember what the beast was? Let's go back. What was the beast? The beast represented government. secular government. The first beast of the sea represented secular government and how Satan uses that and corrupts that to lead people astray. So keep that in mind here. And we see that emphasized also where? What is he, what are they, what's being affected? Poured out of the bowl on the throne of the beast. So now we have a specific throne mentioned. It's emphasizing the kingdom aspect. Uh, first, let's just read that, pair, that sentence in the commentary. The fifth plague parallels the spiritual delusion depicted in 9, 1 through 11. Here the darkness is complete and final. Do you remember when the star fell, great darkness came, and we talked about how that was the devil working to cover up the, the light of the world, Jesus. So false teachings. Here we see the same thing. Now we have the secular government in darkness specifically, uh, why do you think that? What's the darkness symbolizing there? No light of the gospel. No light of the gospel. So people start to put their trust in the government, maybe, or in, in place of God. We talked about that last time. What else could it be? Government can also have things that lead people away from God. Think of the Roman government back in the day. Are you a Christian? Or well, we're going to put you to death right here. Are you a Christian? Go to the Colosseum. You know, things like that. You know, we're going to kill you right here and there. Okay, then people start rejecting the faith. We can kind of see that still today when we see programs uh, within the government that promote false teaching, Things that go directly against God, we can, we can list a number of those if we wanted. Ultimately, is, it also picks, depicts, is the government able to deliver you from the final wrath of God? No, it, it's in straight darkness, and here comes God's wrath upon it. So in a sense, that's also a judgment from God. If you try to put your your faith in secular power and earthly power, well, that's not going to save you. So this darkness aspect could include a few things. And again, verse 11, what's the response to this bowl? Do not repent. Blaspheme the God of heaven, they did not repent. Mark? It's kind of like in Romans chapter 1. You know, neither were they thankful, so God gave them over to all sorts of uncleanness. Yep, giving them into that again, spiritual darkness. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So in the last two bowls, like, I find the last commentary <coughs> very interesting there. The last time, but they did not repent, they gave up praise. They did not repent. Um, 
of their being. So is this, does it mean when we are talking about the beginning of the chapter, like this is it, this is the final, you know, God is done with this but is this almost, is this God having a little bit of hope that some people would then still, or was this just telling us for sure nobody that wasn't, you know, that has basically no unbelievers will repent by this time or what? What I think is, is kind of what we talked about in the beginning. So now we're looking at the same time period, right? The same sort of judgments, and yet these ones are the ones that people are hardening their hearts to, and that's it, right? They didn't repent. So I think that's what's being reflected here, and the finality of that, emphasized especially on the last day when it's too late. But you think even even in between, as the as the author of the study says, even we're, we're still seeing examples of that when people harden their hearts. You know, when people die in unbelief, they basically have already done that, haven't they? They've reflected these, these bowls, so to speak. And that's the judgment that God has allowed them to get into when they keep diving into these things. For, for. So I think that's what's kind of being reflected if I had to, to say that. And that's where the finality aspect of it comes. So these ones, as he says, aren't warning judgments, but these are communication of whom? Good question. Long answer. All right, my, my question for you now. Uh, what are your takeaways or take with yous from the first five bowls? What are your take with yous? Don't take the bowl, but <laughs> some reading. It's interesting how bowls compared to a bowl. That, the aspect of that's it, this is done. Yep. There's, there's a change in emphasis there. It's like this is going to happen. So tell others. So don't take with you the bowl, but take with you the, those things. Next week, we'll dive into the sixth bowl. <laughs> you like my change there? <laughs> that was the easiest one. <laughs> the easiest one ever. Yep. So next week we'll take a look at what are these weird things, huh? <laughs> now you're gonna wonder. Oh, what do you think that is? Every Minnesota's nightmare. I'm sorry, Wisconsinites too. We did have a big hailstorm here not too long ago. We'll say prayer. Lord God in heaven, please strike our hearts, first of all, with your law so that we can be ready, cleansed by the blood of Jesus on the last day. Strike our hearts, therefore, mostly with the gospel as we remember the, the wonderful things Jesus did to win our forgiveness from the wrath coming on that last day. Lord, give us strength so that we can be victors and so that we can also courageously preach your word so that others and join us as victors. We ask that you continue to bless us as we now move into a new church year, as we take a look once again at the words and works of Jesus as they carry us all the way through his life, death, and resurrection. We ask all of this in his glorious name. Amen. Have a good week. Stay warm.